Thank you for joining us as Levi continues our study on the Book of Beginnings, the first book of Moses called Genesis. We're not going to do any Bible questions tonight. We'll save that for next week because I, I want to get right into study. We're doing all Genesis 44 today. All right. So, yeah, all Genesis 44, one shot. All right. No. No. All right. Is the AC set to 69 degrees? Yes. All right, cool. Everybody comfy? Because I'm telling you, they're hot. So, all right. Everyone got a Bible? I would tell the ushers to pass you a Bible, but I have no ushers. So, anyway. So. <laughs> oh, man. Well, let me pray and let's get started. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for all you're providing in this place. And Lord, what you have planned for us and Lord, where we're heading. Lord, I pray you'd speak this through your word. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convey through me what you have for the people. In Jesus name. Amen. amen. So let me start out by saying that um, the Lord's really been doing a work and the way I'm writing towards the end of Genesis, uh, in the last chapters here, I already got all 45 complete. I'm going to start working on 46. Uh, I think the longest one that we're going to discover is Genesis 49, because it reads all the sons and who they were, but there are some things that are missed about what was prophesied about them. And I want to show you these prophecies when we get to 49. These are the connecting verses that are for tonight. So there's just the two right here. Uh, hopefully this has been up long enough that you can take a picture or write it down for yourself. Okay. But tonight's title is called A Real Ch uh, Change in, of Character. All right. In character. And you're going to see why. Now, here's the other thing that I want to share before we get started. There's, there is something happening that is a huge transition in the anchor. And Wednesday, I felt it. I felt it like never before, okay, this transition. And so I have noticed that the Lord has been faithful. Obviously, the Lord has been faithful to the anchor for years. We've been going since 1951. I did not establish it, all right? If I did, I look pretty good for my age. John did not establish it. Let's make that clear right off the get-go, even though he may end up as a sticker. No promises, all right? So now, here's the thing. But the Lord's been faithful to this place, and it started across the street in the Palomar Theater in 1951. It was four gentlemen who wanted to help the place, uh, help the Marines, and they had this vision. And one of them was a sergeant in the Marine Corps, and they were trying to figure out what to do. And they noticed none of the churches really knew what to do with the Marines. They didn't know what to do with the Navy and the aggressiveness that was happening. And as time went forward, yes, there's this part of you know, the uniform and honor and serving your country. But on the, anyone who served knows there is all kinds of debauchery. There is all kinds of sin and problems that come with the military because they get into all kinds of things, right? Even, even when I joined, you know, you're told drugs are bad. Don't do drugs. We do your analysis, stay away from drugs. And then you get offered drugs. All right. A lot of drugs. So I never did drugs. I stayed away from them because I heard all the stories from what happened to my dad. And I was just like, I want nothing to do with drugs. All right. So they, the military being here and the Lord used the anchor started across the street in the Palomar Theater. And the Lord through seasons helped these people reach the military in different occasions. And it was a different style for each occasion because... Some of them were more aggressive when it came to the gospel and they used the King James Bible and they very had like, you know, suits, ties, all these things. As time went forward and they moved into this building in the late 80s, uh, they would stand outside with tracks and pass around tracks and, and, and try to reach the Marines by there. And I started to realize when I started to help here in 2012, um, the tracks weren't working. They wouldn't read them. They would throw them around. If they were polite, they would take them, but the tracks uh, just were not working. And I, I was like, Lord, there's got to be a way to reach them in a better capacity that they'll keep the items and actually take it serious. And so the Lord began to use 
me in this place. And the way I got here was there was a guy who was an army chaplain. His name was Brian Heverin. He was here. Uh, he had the he was running the place as the director, and they had a different system. Their whole system was they would select churches, and the churches would come in weekly and pick their Sunday or Saturday to help because they would only do things pretty much on Saturday and Sunday. It used to be open Sunday, and they would just kind of make sandwiches and talk with the Marines and and come and go. So each church knew their week. They'd bring it in. The director kind of oversaw. And so when I came on, that director wanted to start a Bible study, and he really didn't know what to do. He wanted to figure out a PTSD group because at the time of the height, there was a lot coming from the war. Wounded Warriors was at its full throttle, and, and there was a lot of people wanting to do programs with PTSD. And at that point, I had already gone through the war. I've gone three combat tours. I was sick of talking about PTSD. I was sick of PTSD being my defining factor. And everyone was like, that's the dude with PTSD. And it drove me crazy. Even when I was ordained at Calvary, they were like, that's the pastor with PTSD. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, and, and, you know, the thing is, PTSD doesn't define me. It's not, Jesus defines me, right? PTSD is something that just happens. I know it's like my hip out of place like Jacob has, but it just... It's what's there. And so we started a Bible study. We tried on a Saturday night in that corner right there, 10 people. And it just, it wasn't going anywhere on a Saturday. We realized it wasn't working. And I was like, Lord, what are we supposed to do? And at the time, uh, the Lord was really moving amongst the military because we were teaching a Tuesday night Bible study in a house, Wednesday night at Wounded Warriors, Thursday night at Operation Homefront. And then Sundays, we were at Edson Range, and when we were at Edson Range, we would be there from 6 in the morning to 11 o'clock and just answer Bible questions and try to teach the recruits as much as we could the Bible on the bleachers. In fact, the chaplain, he started to call us, the, the people from the anchor, the punt returners, because he's like, I can put you in the rain, I can put you in the mud, I can put you over here, put you over there. Somehow, you find a way to talk to these guys about Jesus. I didn't have to be inside. I didn't care. My guys didn't care. And it was just, I just was like, Lord, what are we doing? Lord, just make yourself available. And that's what we did. And so this, it all ties into what we're talking about tonight. And I want to show you this because, again, what the Lord is doing. And so it grew. And we started with 10 on Friday here. And it started to grow. And it started to get bigger. And then the places started to fill. But as military is, they come and go. And you have them for seasons. You have them while maybe they're at their schoolhouse. And then they hit the fleet and they forget everything about the Lord because they discovered so much freedom in the barracks and they just want to do the partying over there. Or you discover, they discover you got them for maybe four years and then they move on because they're out of the military and they're from all these different states and they don't know what to do. And the Lord began to bring people in. The Lord began to bring people to stick around and help. So in the long run, Joseph stuck around, others stuck around, right? So... Here's the thing, as the Lord grew it, and as the Lord has been gracious in what he's doing, here we are. It's a packed house, okay? And the thing that I've been praying about was like, Lord, what do you want to do? Because I've been noticing there's been a battle over the anchor. And I feel like every time we get to this point where the, there's this challenge coming, or this system of change that the Lord's going to do for his kingdom, the enemy always seems to do this attack. And so finally, Wednesday, I felt like something lifted. And I remember I was just, I just spent the day going through the word, seeking the Lord, just taking in the word as much as I can and talking to the Lord about things. And by six o'clock at night, I just felt all of a sudden, boom, this thing just lifted up. And I just, I was like, I'm going to go for a walk with the dogs. I was just talking to the Lord while I was walking and I could feel the Holy Spirit moving through my house, moving through where I was. And it felt like this thing just lifted off and everything had changed. And the Lord was like, you finally did exactly where I want you to be. I want you to change it. So my schedule changed for me on Monday and Tuesday. It changed a little bit on Wednesday and Thursday's changing and getting stronger. And here we are Friday and then Saturday. And, and the thing is, it's, you're going to notice it's all going to tie in. The Lord is moving in this place, and he's beginning to move in the area. 
And the Lord is taking back ground for his kingdom. And I believe, and I'm seeing, that a revival is coming to the military. That something is about to happen, and the Lord is going to begin to use here, too, to do it. And we're going to start reaching every area of the military. And, and, and what it is, is it was the spiritual principalities and powers that were trying to stop the gospel from going in. And I believe the Lord is doing again a movement to reach the military community in a new way. Because I am a firm believer, and I've had people completely disagree with me, the military is one of the last mission fields. They're their own culture, their own rules, their own laws. It's completely different when you cross into military bases. And so there is a darkness that has to be dealt with. And so the Lord is working it. So tonight, as we read this and we talk about what's here, you're going to see this all is going to go together. So starting off, we're going to talk about here Genesis chapter 44. Again, following the Anamuni calendar, it's the calendar of the world. It's the Jewish calendar. So again, on the Gregorian or excuse me, the Julian calendar is 2023. According to the Anamundi calendar, it's the year 5784. Very good. So this chapter takes place in the year 2237 on that calendar. Jacob is now 129 years old. Joseph is 38. Reuben is 44. Judah is 42. And Benjamin is 28. He's not a little kid. He's 28 years old. So these are the first verses here. Let's look at verses 1 through Ten. And this is what it says. And again, this is the brothers. They're there with Joseph. And now they're about to leave. And Joseph, this is Joseph speaking. He goes, and he commanded the steward of the house saying, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup of silver in the mouth of the sack of the young, youngest and his grain money. So he did according to the words that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Verse 5. Is not this the one from my Lord drinks and which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan, the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks, how then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of the servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be the Lord's slaves. Verse 10, And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. All right, so I want to look at some things here at the beginning. And again, we're going to finish the whole chapter, right? So the first thing I want to point out to you, starting off, Joseph wants them to think he does divination. Joseph doesn't do divination. He wants them to think he does. You got to remember, in the previous chapter, he put all the brothers in order by birth, not, they're not knowing that this is Joseph. they just like, this is the second in command of, of Egypt under Pharaoh. How does he know? He's putting us all in order of our birth. Hmm. You know? And so now he's, the servant is making them believe this is the cup he does divination with. He does zero divination with the cup. All right? Not at all. It's just a ruse to really see how they're going to react. All right? So... I want you to know that from the get-go. The other part to this, Joseph is doing here, what he's doing is he's setting his brothers to see how they treat Benjamin. How is their attitude towards Benjamin? Because remember, when he was the youngest, how did they treat him? Badly. And now he's like, hmm, has there been a change of character? That's what the real question is. Has there been a change 
in their character. That's what he wants to know. So he set up this trap, this ruse, to actually see what they're going to do. All right? Because they could open all the sacks, find the cup, and be like, Sorry, Benjamin! And they all take off. All right? He wants to see what's going to happen. The other part tonight is this. You ever heard this term? The first impression is the last impression. If you've been in the military, you know this. They tell you this all the time. When you're going to go check in, you got to go check in with your alphas in the Marine Corps. I don't, Navy, what do you guys check in? Is there a certain, huh? Dress whites? Okay. And I think the Army's got dress greens or something like equivalent. And the Air Force, what do they wear when they check in? Civilian clothes? Wow. Okay, well. You are not helping yourself, Mike. All right. Anyway. Cupcake, anyone? All right, so. That term, first impression is the last impression, right? But, okay, but that's not always true. Okay, we're taught that from business world. We're taught that from the military. We're taught that in different occasions. But the reality is people can change. But how do they change? By Jesus, yes. Can you change on your own? No. New Year's resolutions. Who's all said they were going to do one? I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to drink less. I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop eating bacon. Who has a New Year's resolution saying they're going to stop eating bacon? All right. So now you make a New Year's resolution and maybe you go to the gym. You get the gym membership. You go to the gym. It lasts one month. And then guess what happens? You don't really go to the gym anymore. Right. Or you say, you know, I'm, I'm really going to watch what I eat just to be like tomorrow. Chili cheese dog tonight. All right. Now. But the thing is, you cannot change on your own. Only the Lord can change you. Change by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, and I've heard people say this too. Nobody really changes. Nobody really changes. They can't change. Well, people change again when Jesus gets a hold of them. When Jesus gets a hold of them and changes their heart. Notice in the picture, it's a, it's a heart of stone that's coming out. And he gives them a heart of flesh. Then they really change, right? Then they really have a radical change. And when the Lord is in your life and you are following and obeying him, then you will continue to change. The Lord radically changed me. He's radically changing you. And if you continue in the word of God and you continue in his grace and you are in prayer, you'll continue to change. You will be more like Christ. No prayer, no power. All right. And that's the thing. You have to be in prayer. And this is why the enemy hates prayer. He doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want your family to pray. He doesn't want the church to pray. He doesn't want the pastors to get together and pray. He doesn't want anyone in fellowship to pray. Because when we pray, there is power in the name of Jesus. All right. And again, that prayer is talking to God and spending time with him. We are not talking about some ritualistic repetitional prayer that you think is going to be like Harry Potter and do something. That doesn't work. It has to be real from your heart, letting the Lord deal with you. A real change of character. Not just, you know, Lord God, thank you for today. I really appreciate everything that's going on. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's nothing. It's like a relationship between a husband and a wife. Real conversation, real depth of intimacy, real depth of communication of intimacy, not just checking the box, checking the box, checking the box. For you, for everyone who's married or who's had a desire for a really good relationship that reflects Christ, it's the same thing as we walk with Christ and he changes us is how the marriage is. That's why Ephesians talks about that. By the way, after Genesis, we're going to Ephesians. That's the book we're going to do. All right. But Ephesians talks all about marriage and all about the depth of it. And it's a similar walk with the Lord. This is why men, you're called to be the high priest of your household. And where you lead, you will lead your family in. So don't lead your family into danger. All right. Now you could be like, I hear you. I hear you, Levi. But I made messes. I, I ruined it. Okay. But the Lord makes all things new. And what the locusts have eaten, 
the Lord can restore. All right? He makes all things new. All right? So you have to trust Him. You have to stay close to Him. And you have to obey Him. And He makes all things new. All right? It's so important. Now, here's the thing. I understand why people... Uh, they test people to see if there's a real change in their life because there's many people who will use the church to say, oh no, I, I went down there and I heard the guy preach or I heard, I heard the sermon and I went forward and gave my life to Christ. Sweetie, I'm a changed man. No, you're not. Because in your heart, there's wickedness. Real change shows real character of change. It shows that you don't want to do the things you used to do. You don't want to be in darkness. And there are people who can fake it, right? They know how to fake it. But guess what? You cannot fake it before the Lord. No. Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, know it. The Lord knows your heart. You can come and be like, Amen, Amen, Amen. You can have the most amazing, immaculate Bible. It can be bedazzled. It can be King James. You can quote it. You can rapid fire quote the scripture over and over and over and over. But if your heart is wicked, it means nothing. And unfortunately, there are people who sit in the church and they act like they're good with the Lord and they're a solid mess because they believe nothing they read. They practice nothing that Jesus says. They do not abide in Christ. They do not walk with Christ. And they have no real change and no root in them and no fruit. And they will find themselves cut off and thrown into the fire. Jesus said it himself. This is not my words. This is Jesus' words. Many will come in the last days. This is Matthew 7. This is Jesus' words. Saying, Lord, Lord. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And they're like, but we cast out demons in your name. We did signs and wonders in your name. We did many works in your name. And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. Practice lawlessness. Not, oops, I made a mistake. Now, oops, I stubbed my toe in the middle of the night and said something I shouldn't. Because my son says, shins are for discovering things in the dark. <laughs> All right? So, this is not that. This is practicing lawlessness. All right? So, the Lord knows what's in your heart. And there has to be a real change within your heart. It has to be a continual change. And if you stay in the Word of God... And you go through the word of God, it will wash you and clean you out. And you will have a real change within. The other thing, before we move forward, I want you to know this. There are four soils when it comes to the gospel. The path, the rocks, the weeds, and the good soil. And this is what Jesus said again. He tells the story of the parable. And, and so the sower goes out to sow. And the seed falls into these four soils. It says that the path, the bird comes and steals the seed away. And the disciples all want to know what each soil means. And he, he breaks it down for them. And he goes, look, the bird is Lucifer. It's Satan. It's his, it's his darkness. It's his demonic realm. It's his fallen ones. And they steal the word away right away when someone hears it. Those people won't even have a chance to hear the gospel. They'll hear it and I'm done. They'll walk out. They, they'll walk away. They'll cuss you out. They're like, screw you. I don't need that. And that's what will happen. The ones that fall in the rocks, it says they go in to the soil and they begin to grow. But then when the sun comes out, because their root is not deep, they can't handle it and they wither away and die. And these are people who hear the gospel. They hear about what Jesus has done on the cross. They hear about how he has resurrected from the dead and they take it with joy and it goes in and they're excited about it. But as the minute it becomes a challenge, the minute people are watching, the minute it's a challenge to them, or someone might say something, they're nowhere to be found. They run away. And they may even come to Bible study. They may come to church with you a couple times. But then when somebody back at your house, back at the barracks, back wherever, says, hey man, you one of those Jesus people? No, 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 they disappear. And they have nothing to do with it. The next soil is the weeds. And the seed goes in, and again, they receive it with joy, and they hear it. But the problem is the weeds choke the life out of it because they love the cares of the world. They want all the power, money, sex, drunkenness, whatever the world can give them to the depth they want it, and they don't want to let it go, and they 
get choked out, and that's it. And the last one, it goes in, the roots grow deep, and it produces fruit 30, 50, 100 fold. And these are the ones that are really in Christ. See, it produces fruit. It's not just producing where it's like, yeah, man, like I'm bringing people to church because that's not it. You could, you could do big campaigns and bring a bunch of people in. You could do programs out the wazoo to attract people to all kinds of places. And, and it's, it's, it's a flash in the pan because it's excitement and it's over. When it really goes in, it's the real deal. And what it's talking about is then there's peace, love, joy, kindness. The fruit of the Spirit then is there and you, the, the, the works of the flesh start to disappear. And so I want you to think about this as we go forward, okay? So starting in verse 11 through 17, it goes on to say, Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. So he searched, and he began with the oldest, and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, each man loaded his donkey, and returned to the city. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to him, What deed is this that you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? And how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord, slaves, both we and he also with him who the cup was found. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. As for you, go up in peace to your father. Again, Joseph playing the ruse to see their character is like, oh, don't you know I can do divination? Joseph's not doing divination. He's just making them believe he can because he knows who they are. He knows how to set everything up. Okay? So I want you to remember that. Now, notice again, Judah and his brothers believe that the Lord is punishing them. That the Lord is punishing them for what they did to Joseph. Will the Lord correct you? You betcha the Lord will correct you. Because if the Lord loves you, the Lord will correct you. And if you love the Lord and you belong to him, he will correct you. If you are living in sin, you are playing with sin and you don't feel any remorse or correction. You need to take a hard look where you stand because something's gone very wrong. When I have said things I'm not supposed to, I feel the Holy Spirit right away and go, what are you doing? When I have had the wrong attitude, I feel the Lord correct me. When I have messed myself up, I feel the Lord correct me. If you are playing in sin and you're like, no, no, I go to church and, and then I do my thing, then you, you're not really in Christ. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Years ago, there used to be a gentleman who came here to the Bible studies. He would come here. He would listen. He had the Bible. He was very adamant about things and very proper and he'd get even frustrated that pastors had tattoos how could they have tattoos and he would sit in here and he'd be like you have to be right with the lord and then he would leave and go find prostitutes now this is how it came to an end he kept doing that he left here he goes to find the spot where they're all at and he knows where that and he usually picks up a girl and the girl saw him put her purse up like this to her face and a gargling voice came out and said, I know where you just came from. What are you doing here? And he, ne and he came back here, told me what he did and what he'd been up to. And he repented. The problem is he wanted to play in two worlds. You cannot have two masters, one master. You will either serve Jesus or you will serve Lucifer. What, what, so Lucifer? I, whoa, that's a little extreme. I just, I'm just into my, my stuff. Well, the master of this world is who? This world's turned over to who? Lucifer. Lucifer, until Jesus comes and puts his kingdom. He has bought it with his blood, 
and he is pulling everyone to his kingdom that is listening. But until the kingdom is established, Lucifer will rule and reign as he pleases. And he will have his people do as they please. Because this, and it, it, this is out of the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus was being tempted, Lucifer took him on the high place and said, All the kingdoms of the world were given to me. If you bow down and worship me, I will give them to you. Jesus didn't refute him. He didn't rebuke him on it because it was true. When Adam and Eve sinned and they turned dominion over to Lucifer, it all became his. And so Jesus bought it back with his blood and his kingdom will come. And that's the promise. All right. That will happen again. Joseph is testing them. Joseph's te uh, testing them entirely. Let's go to verses 18 to 34. This is the end of the chapter. So, starting in 18, it says, Then Judah came near to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. And do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord, ask his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, who is the youngest, his brother, is dead. So he's saying Joseph is dead, but he's not really talking to Joseph. And he alone is left, and his mother's children, and his father loves him. Verse 21. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servant, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy a little food. Verse 26. But we said, we cannot go down for if the youngest brother is with us, then we will go down for we may see the man's face unless the youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons, and that one went out from me and said, surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. Verse 29, but if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. Verse 32, for your servant became surety for the lad to my father saying if i do not bring him back to you then i shall bear the blame before my father forever now therefore please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my lord and let the lad go up to his brothers for how shall i go up to my father if the lad is not with me lest perhaps i see the evil that would come upon my father all right, so we have this interaction, Judah and Joseph. We have this moment where they are they're discussing this. So I want to I wanna show you this. And as we're building, this is, this is the heart of it. This is the meat and potatoes of the whole event right here. And why I'm saying this change of character, why it's saying it, it's everything moving forward from here. Judah is now standing up for Benjamin, all right? And Judah, after all these years, will not let any... Thing bad happened to Benjamin. All right, he won't let it happen. And when Judah approaches Joseph and he comes near, he, it's a very interesting Hebrew word. All right, let me see. Click. No. Nope. Nope. There it is. Oh, okay, it's this word right here. This word is vayagash. So in in the, in English letters, it's V A. Y I G A S H. Vayagash. All right. V A Y I G A S H. It means near, 
but it has an indication of a challenging a person. So now he's at the second command of somebody. He sees this coming and he is getting in Joseph's personal space about his little brother, Benjamin, not getting all riled up, not like we're going to fight, but he is very concerned, being respectful, but he is closing the gap between him and Joseph about Benjamin. He is showing this is serious. I'm getting in your personal space for a reason to show you this. All right. And there's a reason why this is happening, why he's getting so close in, but he's yet he's being respectful, but aggressive. You ever seen that before where you're respectful, but aggressive. All right. So I want you to picture this. So now as this challenge is happening, there's a few things to point out here. First of all, okay, with this, as it's happening, all right, in this challenge, there is a spiritual image and a foreshadow happening at the same time. There is something happening in the spirit that is connected to the foreshadow of what is to come in the New Testament and everything. So the foreshadow, the foreshadow here that we're seeing as Judah is closing in the gap on Joseph like this, and they're literally coming together, all right? It is two kingdoms, two kingdoms. One kingdom is the kingdom of Judah, the Davidic monarchy, all right? And the other is the kingdom of the north through Ephraim. Who's Ephraim? No, who's Ephraim? Joseph's son. It's one of Joseph's sons. So notice how, again... From the house of Joseph. So we have Judah and Joseph, the Davidic kingdom and monarchy, closing in on the northern kingdom of Ephraim. Because at, at the point in the future, there will be a civil war after Solomon's done and his son takes over. And he won't listen to any counsel of the men who worked with Solomon. And he'll only listen to the counsel of these young guys that have no idea how to run a kingdom or do politics and make things worse. And start destroying the nation. Hmm. So now. All right. But now it's this foreshadow that's coming. These two houses coming together. All right. This is also the house of Joseph. Like I said. The house of Judah. The, of the line of David. And the house of Joseph. Which is King Jeroboam. King Jeroboam comes in the future. And again. These two. Because Jeroboam comes of the line of Ephraim. And so there's these two things happening. Foreshadowing forward. Of what's going to happen, okay? Now, before I go forward, I forgot to mention again, we're going to do communion tonight. So if you're watching online, make sure you have what you need for communion so you can partake with us. But at the very end, we're going to do communion, all right? So the foreshadow. Now, the spiritual part, because there's a spiritual image. And always remember this. First the natural, then the supernatural. For everything that you see in the natural, there's a reflection into the supernatural. Are you saying there's cars and boats? No, that's not what I'm talking about. There's a physical you and there's a spiritual you. There's a physical tabernacle and there's a spiritual tabernacle in heaven. All right. There are these elements. So the spiritual, the spiritual is Judah represents the lion because his symbol is the lion. And Joseph is represented by an ox. Okay. By an ox. So we have the lion and the ox. All right. The two. And so Joseph is going to move or he's moved with compassion. All right. Over what Judah says. This is what happens. Joseph's moved by compassion by what Judah is telling him about his father, about the trouble, about what's to come. So Joseph, he's having this moment. Joseph representing the ox. Judah representing the lion. OK, this is the spiritual aspect of this. OK. So again, moving into his personal space, what it indicates is this, all right? I'm going to show you this. Joseph, remember, is a form of the suffering Messiah, Mashiach ben Yosef in Hebrew. Jesus was a suffering Messiah. And then there's the conquering Messiah, Mashiach ben David, or the Messiah of David. Jesus is also the conquering Messiah that will come again and put his kingdom. Joseph representing that the ox is for the slaughter. When we get to the, the law of Moses, one of the ways to get rid of sin is to kill a what? An ox. Sheep, goat, ox, or a lamb. Or, or a dove, excuse me. And here we have this ox for the sacrifice. But there is the conquering Messiah represented by the lion. 
the Lion of Judah who will conquer all. And notice how they're closing the gap, closing the gap, closing the gap. And it's indicating that the two messiahs are really one. There is only one, and his name is Jesus. He's the one who came and died on the cross to set us free and resurrected from the dead. He has overcome death and the powers of hell, and he is the conquering lion of Judah. But he was also the lamb that was slain. He is the, the whole propitiation for sin. He is the whole thing that was killed for, on a cross, brutally murdered, so we could be set free. But if he just died on the cross and never resurrected, then what's it for? See, he, see Allah died, or not Allah, me, Allah, Muhammad died, right? You know, Buddha died. All these people that were supposed to be holy men died. And Jesus is not just a holy man. Jesus is fully God. He is God in the flesh that has come down to set us free. And yet he's the son of God. He is, he is, when you see, this is why he tells Thomas, if you see me, you've seen the Father. He is fully it. All the other religious symbols that are out there, their men died and they remained dead. But Jesus is alive. And here is the foreshadow of the whole thing in the Spirit showing the indication that the Messiah is one, right? And again, here's where we go. Judah, and at this what I'm going to do is when we do communion, I'm going to have them pass out communion to you. But when they bring the bread, which I'm going to have them do in about one minute right here, you're going to tear a piece off of this bread. All right. So you guys can go ahead if you if you have it prepped to start doing that. Because I want you guys to have the elements of communion while I break this down. And, and so at the end we could do this. I want you to think about this now. Judah wants to exchange his life for Benjamin. He wants to exchange his life for Benjamin. Jesus exchanged his life for us. Judah is willing to be a slave and give up his life so Benjamin can go free. Jesus gave up everything so we could go free. He came out of heaven. He gave up his throne. Born of a virgin, a helpless baby, came here, died on a cross so we could be free. Judah is a foreshadow of this. All right. And what's also interesting here is it points to two foreshadows here of Messiah. All right. Remember the suffering servant when Jesus came? He didn't come to conquer. He came here to pay the penalty for sin. He came here so we could be free, but he will come again and he will conquer every enemy. And the, and the Bible says that he'll put all his enemies under his feet. All right. He will rule and reign in the millennial kingdom and he'll set everything right. All right. Now, again, here at this point, Judah is foreshadowing the Messiah that would give his life to conquer death and sin. And what we're going to see in the next chapter, ladies and gentlemen, is that Joseph can't take it anymore. And he's going to reveal who he is, crying and weeping. He's going to send all the Egyptians out of the, the place, only leaving his brothers going, I'm Joseph that you sold into slavery because he can't take it anymore. But Judah is now foreshadowing this to take the place of what needs to happen for for everything all right so he's giving his life and here's the other thing ladies and gentlemen here's a spiritual application how you apply it to your life okay just as we see that the law has been broken right and even though it was a test to see how they treated Benjamin. Benjamin, thank you, represents two things. Benjamin not only represents the Jewish community here, but Benjamin represents me and you. Did you know that? He represents me and you. Because, thank you, sir. This is why. Benjamin represents us because 
Jacob is the father, representing the father, God the father. Judah representing the son. And, and the thing is this, if you pay attention, Judah knew it would break Jacob's heart that Benjamin would end in bondage. Do you know it breaks God's heart if you end up in bondage? When you end up in the bondage of sin, God's heart breaks for you. Because he doesn't want you in that bondage. He wants you to be free from that bondage. He wants you to know true freedom in him. True freedom in what Jesus did on the cross. And Egypt is a type of the world. It's a type of the world. And when you're in bondage to the sin of this world, God's heart breaks. And when his little ones turn from him and they turn to sin and say, no, I don't want to obey, his heart breaks. This is why Jesus will go find the one and leave the 99. And what you need to know is that the, pay, the price has been paid and that you've been set free. But God's heart, heart breaks for you. You were once lost. And if you're sitting here tonight and you're broken and lost, you need to be healed and you need to be set free. You need to know that Jesus is the answer. He's it. I want everyone to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And this is what it says. You guys have probably heard this. And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. See, what happens is a lot of people go, well, God works for the good of all things. Amen. Done. Read the rest. All right. Works for the good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. You know there's a calling on your life, each one of you? Each one of you in the room, there's a calling on your life. Each one of you listening online, there's a calling on your life. You all have a calling. I don't care if you're a little tiny baby like Dominic and little kindergarten like Annie or a great hair saint in here. There's a calling on your life. Well, I'm, I'm older and I, I don't know what I could do in my life. Moses was 80 and called to liberate a nation. So what's your excuse? All right. Well, I don't have time. There's time. Everyone's got 24 hours in a day. It's all in what you want to do. God works to the good of it because there's a calling on your life. All right. The Lord works in you and he'll continue. Turn to Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 25. This is 25 to 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. I lost my spot. Here we go. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins now this is beautiful because Jesus again was sent to make us free and if you have an attitude of I don't need to be free I don't need no one paying for me I pay for my own sins you don't know what you're asking for I don't like free gifts you don't know what you're asking for. And here's the thing too. If you're in here tonight or you're listening online and you're arguing in yourself or you're going, well, the reality is I don't like it when people give me charity. I don't like it when people try to give me free gas cards or stuff. Then you don't know how to receive good things from God. The whole thing of receiving from someone is to learn how God gives us things. And it's hard. I find it very hard for people sometimes to receive things because the Lord wants to give us good things. God loved us so much that he made a way. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved the world so much, he gave his begotten son. All right? That's how much God loves you. He loved you so much, Jesus paid the penalty for us to be free. A penalty that we cannot fulfill. 
And there's people who are like, well, I want justice. Then you know what you're asking for? Hell. Oh, you're saying, then send me to hell because I want justice. Yeah. What you need is mercy and grace. Yep. Mercy and grace. Mercy is you don't have to pay the penalty. And grace is you get much more than you deserve. It's like this. This is the best way I can explain it to you. You're at home. Someone breaks into your house. Justice is I can shoot them. I can call the cops. I can tackle them. I can beat them. That is justice. Mercy is, hey, dude, get out of my house. Like, just go. And you let them go. Grace is this. Are you hungry? I'll make you a meal. What's going on in your life that you felt you need to break into my house? That's grace. All right? So be careful when you say, I want justice. Because you don't know what you're asking for sometimes. All right? Who gets vengeance? The Lord does. Let the Lord get it. Let the Lord get justice. Are you saying don't go to court? Nope, that's not what I'm saying. You got to go to court? Go to court. Let the Lord get justice. Let the Lord stand for you in this. Because there are things that will happen that you have to go to court for. But this is also why Jesus warned and said, Hey, if you can make it right before they take you to court, then do that. All right? And so... The Lord will fight for you. He gave us everlasting life. The question you have to ask is, where do I stand? Where do I stand? All right? <laughs> Just as the brothers did not know this was Joseph, and many Jews don't realize that Jesus is Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, He's the Messiah, all right? from the tribe of Judah. However, Paul, again, wrote in 11, what we just read, Romans 11, verse 25, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Do you guys know what the fullness of the Gentiles is? It's when the last Gentile comes to know Jesus, the rapture will happen. We don't know the count of the Gentiles. Every time there's salvation, the count of the Jews is there. Every time there's the feeding, it's the Jews. When it comes to the count of the Gentiles, there's no count. We don't know. It's a mystery. When the last one comes in, then it's over. And when that last one comes in, the 70th week of Daniel will begin. The rapture of the church will happen. And then the Jews at the three and a half year mark will know who Messiah is. Some will begin to see it in the beginning. This is what the 144,000 is that will stand up and start preaching the gospel. But at the three and a half year mark, the Antichrist will walk into the temple and he will proclaim that he is God. And the Jews will be like, wait a minute, time out. This is not who we, we thought he was. And they'll start to realize that Jesus is truly the messianic king. Can you say that tonight that you know who he is? And let me put it to you like this. Not that, yeah, I just know Jesus. Because you can say any celebrity and people know who they are. Oh yeah, Brad Pitt. Yeah, I know that guy. That's from that one movie. That's the dude that was married to, An 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 uh, what's her name? Angela. Angela Jolie. I can't say her name. You know? Kobe Bryant. Oh, yeah. Basketball player. Paul Molitor. Oh, yeah. Played for the Milwaukee Brewers. You know? But, it, but the thing is, is, it's not that you just know them. Do they know you? And the thing is, you like, oh, yeah, Jesus from the Bible. Great guy. Loves everybody. Good teachings. You know? I love going to church. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good morals. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you walk with Jesus? Is there a change happening in you? A real change of character happening in you that your heart of stone has become a heart of flesh and you're a changed person. That's what it's all about. And that's why I'm saying something radically changed on Wednesday and what's coming. Because the Lord is going to begin to pour into people to start changing them for the gospel, changing them for his kingdom, because the countdown is going down, and it's going down fast. And the thing is, is I encourage each one of you to share the gospel like there's no tomorrow. Share like there's no tomorrow. Plan like you got the rest of everything, but share like if tonight's it. If you knew that 2 a.m. the rapture was going to happen, how many people in the streets would you be sharing the gospel with tonight? Would you go to bed tonight going, yeah, 
I'll just be in my PJs when the rapture happens. And they figure it out, they figure it out. Or would you be like, holy cow, we got to figure out how to tell everybody. How many family members would you call? How many would you be like, it's one in the morning, mom. Listen, you have to listen, you know. Or would you be like, ah, you know, they saw how we lived. They'll figure it out. So why don't we share the gospel like that? Because tomorrow's not promised to you. All right. That is my encouragement. Let's, let's take communion together. And the reason I did it this way with this bread is, one, this is a type of bread that's used, but I, it was something in having you each tear a piece. Because it's in the tearing that Jesus went through that he healed us. He was beaten, abused, bloodied. His own mother couldn't recognize him on the cross. He, he was beat so many times his his back was open he was just a bloody pulp and the thing is most people who took beatings like that don't live they don't survive they don't even make it to the cross and jesus made it because he paid the penalty for us so jesus taking the cup and the bread he breaking the bread he said this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me. And taking the cup, giving it to the disciples said, this is my blood that is spilled out for the remission of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord God, for tonight. Thank you for your word, for all you're doing. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, you would move upon the people, that the sick would be healed, that the brokenhearted would be mended. Lord, that those who are standing in arrogance and pride would be brought down, that they would stay close to you. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to heal and move. I pray, Holy Spirit, you continue to use this place. And I pray if there's anyone here tonight or listening online that needs to get right with you, Lord, I pray that they would. I pray that they would continue in your word, grow in your word, and I pray that each one would be emboldened for the gospel. And I pray that for anyone here tonight or listening later, that you're just holding on to the things of the world. You're arguing within yourself that you want to hold on to things because you think you have to negotiate. I pray that you would let go of this world because it's nothing but a dung heap. And you can't take it with you. And nobody who when a hearse is going to a funeral, there's a U-Haul coming behind it. So Lord, I pray that they would learn to let go and know that the real treasure is in heaven and the real treasure is to follow you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.